our culture does very poorly dealing with problems that evolve very slowly. You know, all of a sudden people have woken up to the fact that there's a distribution of income problem in this country. There's an economic myth that the investing process is purely rational and like everything that the economics profession likes to profess, it's based on assumptions that generally don't equate to reality. If you look at my screen, you can see almost every day euphoria or panic, herd mentality. There's emotion going through the entire investing process every single day. There's no getting away from, I think, human analysis and interpretation. I mean, I'll give you an example. So when the, da the securitization data started to deteriorate, you know, my conclusion was it's over. The housing bull market is over, housing prices are going to go down, there's going to be massive losses. That was my conclusion. Other people reach a different conclusion. They looked at the data and they said, well, historically the data has been great. This data that, that was created in 2006 is starting to look bad but it's probably just what they call the burnout problem. We'll burn out the, the few bad loans and then we'll be back to where we were. And it wasn't until over a year later that they realized that they were wrong, but it was too late. I wrote a report when I was on the sell side in 1994 about the credit card industry pointing out that there was a massive distribution of income problem in the United States and that what you were going to see was a big growth in subprime credit cards because that's where the bodies were. So this is not a, a new problem, it's a very old problem. It's taken 30 years of evolution for, for people to finally realize it's a problem, but you could have seen this if you were looked carefully 20 years ago. I'm gonna leave aside the stock market for a moment. If you look at housing since World War II, although there have been pockets where housing prices went down, so for example, Texas went down, I believe, in the late 80s, early 90s. But outside of certain regional pockets, housing prices have only, nationally have only gone up since World War II. So by the time the crisis took place, you know, I would say it was consensus that housing prices in the United States go up as if it's a law of physics. It's a little bit like being Noah in the ark. You know, Noah's on the ark. His family is safe, and everybody outside is screaming and drowning. It's not pleasant, but there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it wasn't like I was quiet. Anybody who wanted to know what I thought, I was speaking it from the rooftops. <laughs> My wife used to yell at me, begging me when we would go out to dinner with friends. She would say, please, do not do you do the, this is the end of Western civilization speech. People need to eat. Um, but nobody really cared what I had to say. I don't like it when people get ripped off, and I especially don't like it when rich people rip off everybody else. I mean, I think the biggest problem facing our country is the distribution of income. It really explains why growth is not any more than 2%. In fact, growth historically hasn't been more than 2%, but people have supplemented it in the past by taking out home equity loans. So that's gone. So the 2% of economic growth that you see is probably the full potential that the U.S. is capable of doing. And that's probably going to last for quite a number of years. And there's really not much point in trying to change that through monetary policy. You might be able to change it through fiscal policy, but given our political structure, that's unlikely. Um, the only thing that really worries me outside of that is China because China is the, the driver of capital expenditures, expenditures all over the globe. If China continues to slow, it has implications for world growth. I don't think people have forgotten about the financial crisis. I mean, for a while it seems that they forgot. Now that there's a presidential election, it seems to be at the forefront these days. What I think people are most upset about is that nobody went to jail. You know, if people had gone to jail, they wouldn't be quite so upset about the financial crisis. 
The hardest thing in the world to do, I find, is to try and think outside your own society's paradigm. You know, people like to call that thinking outside the box. I'm talking about something that's broader than that. You know, thinking outside the box is sometimes people are long years short. Uh, thinking outside your society's paradigm is really questioning the underlying assumptions under which everybody seems to operate. It's something that I've tried to do my whole career. Sometimes I'm successful at it, and oftentimes not.